Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Theo Hikmat here. Friends call me Jason Zelda, singer, songwriter, Bible teacher, and now author of the new ebook, The Whistleblower's Lighthouse, a handbook for reaching Jehovah's Witnesses for Jesus. This 500 plus page PDF took me about a year to put together, and there's a ton of information in there. There's audio, video, documentation, photocopies, various things, even some rare pictures in there to help you reach your friends, family, or others who may be stuck and trapped within the Jehovah's Witness cult. If you've been beating your head against a wall trying to figure out how come you can't seem to get through to your Jehovah's Witness friends and family, this ebook should help quite a bit in helping you understand what's going on and giving you some new ideas and new ways of reaching those who were trapped and are trapped in the Jehovah's Witness organization. I'm hoping it'll be a great help to you all. You will find it at my website, Jason Zelda, like the video game, The Legend of Zelda, jasonzelda.xyz, jasonzelda.xyz. And the price is very affordable for everyone. I designed the site in such a way that you can pay any price that you want to pay over $2. So if you want to pay $3 for this 500 plus page ebook, you can do that. If you want to pay 30, if you want to pay 300, if you want to pay whatever you want, you can pay whatever you want over $2 because they have fees and things that they take out every time a book sells. So I have to cover those fees. So I hope that book, the ebook will be very beneficial to you. I have QR codes in there that you can click using Google Lens or various other QR code readers that'll take you to audio, video, websites, and various different things to give you even more information about the topics that I'm covering. Now, speaking of topics being covered, I asked you guys to send me some questions in the comments section. If you had questions about the Word of God, the good old King James Bible, if you had some questions about what's in this book or things, feel free to ask, and I'll try to be as honest as I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know. If I do know, I'll try my best to get it out to you, break it down, and help you understand, because there's no reason to run away from this book. There's no reason to be afraid of this book. There's no reason people would be attacking this book if they only understood what it is. Okay, it's the most important book on the planet, and that's why it comes under attack all the time. So I want people to understand it. I want them to believe it. And it really frustrates me when people come on the scene and they just feel like it's their life's mission to try to destroy this book. So I want to try to do what I can to try to help out. I'm going to be answering three questions at least in this video that was sent to me. And we're going to get started right now. So Nikoloff, 1815, wrote... What about the Johannian comma? Has this been added to the KJV to promote the Trinity? Now, this term that he used here is a term that is used for the book of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. It is what we would call when I was growing up the Trinitarian proof text. When people ask, you know, is God a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three separate beings that share the same nature of being God, they say, well, what's the proof in the Bible? That's the verse. It says, For there are three that bears record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's what it says there in the King James Bible. But when you look for that very same verse in a lot of the so-called modern translations, you discover that that verse is strangely missing. Part of the verse has been completely taken out and is gone. And it's depressing to see what they have done to the Word of God in these so-called modern translations. Well, I want to deal with this because the person underneath sent a comment using the name of Yahuwah 1259. Now I want to read what this person wrote and then we're going to break down the full understanding of what in the world is going on here so people can understand what's happening. This person writes, Jason Zelda, hello. Unfortunately, I don't think I was clear. You didn't prove your point exactly. You did prove 1 John 5, 7 is in the Latin Bible. But I would assume you knew I was referring to the Greek. What you also proved is, one, 
It doesn't seem you did the proper research. You just cut and pasted something off the internet. 2. You didn't even check the sources for what you cut and pasted. Let me give you an example. You referenced 200 AD. Tertullian wrote, which three are one, based on the verse in his angst Pregress, kind of hard to pronounce some of these words because they're ancient words. Chapter 25. But the full quote is, these three are one essence, not one person, as it is said. I and my father are one, John 10.30. What you cut and pasted wasn't quoted all the way. The Tertullian was referring to John 10.30, not 1 John 5.7. And then you cited 415 AD, Council of Carthage appealed to 1 John 5-7 when debating Arian beliefs, but failed to see Eugenius was using a Latin Bible, not the Greek. Can you provide the name of the Greek manuscript that has 1 John 5-7 before 1600, yes or no? Give me a primary source, not something that you cut and paste that misleads people. So, I'm being accused of cutting and pasting and misleading people because he wrote to me asking me for proof that 1 John 5, 7 belongs in the Bible. One of the issues that we have today is people love to attack this book. They love to attack this King James Bible. And what they love to attack most is the deity of Christ, the fact that Jesus is God. So every verse in the Bible that identifies Jesus as God comes under attack. Every one of them comes under attack by people who feel that these verses don't belong in the Bible. Whether it's John chapter 1 verse 1, there are some who feel they need to change that verse for it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. There are those who seek to change that verse. Or whether it be 1 Timothy 3.16 where it says without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You'll notice in the so-called modern translations, it no longer says God was manifest in the flesh. They completely change the verse to remove the deity from Jesus. And it's a disgrace. So this person here is asking, where is 1 John 5, 7 in Greek manuscripts? Because the New Testament was originally written in Koine Greek. Now, how would you answer that question? How would you answer it? In order to answer it, you have to know a bit of history. And sadly, in our information age, it surprises me how little history is actually taught anymore. So I'm going to take you guys down the journey of history. To understand what happened with a lot of the manuscripts that were made. The Jewish people were writing these manuscripts by hand. And from what I understand, for decades I've been told they had a technique for writing these manuscripts to make sure that every manuscript was a mirror copy of the one before. It had something to do with counting how many letters fit in each column, how many columns fit on each page, and various different things. And they would know if the column didn't have the right amount of letters, there's something messed up, and so forth and so on. They made sure that these manuscripts were accurate. But what ended up happening is they kept coming under persecution. To this day, 2024, the Jewish people are still coming under persecution. People attacking them, and then out of the blue, people are defending the ones who are attacking them and accusing the Jewish people of committing genocide. When if you knew history, you would know that the most, the, the group on earth that has been persecuted the most has been the Jews. The whole story has been turned around. The persecution and the destruction of manuscripts, the burning of the manuscripts and the burning of the Bibles 
is a history that needs to be told. When Jesus left this earth, his disciples preached Jesus, created Christians all over. When the disciples died, the Christians continued to preach Jesus. But there arose a religion on the face of the earth that wanted to have power and wanted to have control. And they were going to try to seize that power and that control by force if they had to. Their name is the Roman Catholic Church. If you know much about the real history of the Catholic Church and not the version of the Catholic Church that you hear about on the news, you would know that the Catholic Church, while claiming to be Christian, is not Christian. The Catholic Church's leadership and their teachings has been some of the most anti-Christian philosophies that you can run into because their history in the past has been burning our Bibles and killing Christians while claiming they're the true Christians, therefore they're getting rid of us because as far as they're concerned, we're heretics because we didn't follow the Catholic system. Therefore, we were worthy of death. If you don't know the real history of the Catholic Church, you're going to be like this guy asking me, where are the manuscripts? How come we can't find manuscripts before the 1600s dealing with this verse? So let's take a journey down history. See what we find out. I'm going to put the links for these things on the description, in the description, so that people will be able to read these things as well. Somebody took the time, actually, to compile all these. So he might accuse me of cutting and pasting, but it doesn't matter. If it's the facts, it's the facts. Whether I cut and paste it or whether I type it out. And I'll explain what he's talking about as we get to it. We need to understand what happened with the manuscripts. In the year 1215, Pope Innocent III issued a law commanding that they shall be seized for trial and penalties who engage in the translation of the sacred volumes. This is found in History of the Church, Volume 6, page 723. You have a papal decree saying anyone who is found engaging in the translation of the sacred volumes is to be seized for trial and have penalties against them. The Council of Toulouse, 1229, forbade the laity. Now, the laity would be like the average person that goes to church. It forbade the laity to possess or read the vernacular translations of the Bible. This council ordered that the bishops should appoint in each parish one priest or two or three laics who should engage upon oath to make a rigorous search after all heretics and their abettors. And for this purpose should visit every house from the garret to the cellar together with all subterraneous places where they might conceal themselves. They also searched for illegal Bibles. The laity is us. The average person. The Catholic Church is handing down the law in 1229 that you and I are not supposed to possess or read any translation of the Bible but theirs. This is before the King James Bible came out, by the way. And the King James Bible is not a Catholic Bible. But I'm wanting you to understand why it was so important for there to be a King James Bible. When you see what the Catholic Church was doing with the Bibles. Let's keep going. Not only did they say that we're not allowed to, to have a Bible. They went on to say they searched for illegal Bibles. This came from a History of the Reformation in Spain. 1856, page 82. So they went out house to house, searching for Bibles. What were they going to do with them? You'll see. In 1483, the infamous Inquisitor General Thomas Torquemada began his reign of terror as head of the Spanish Inquisition. King Ferdinand and his queen forbidden all under the severest pains from translating the sacred scripture into the vulgar tongues or from using it when translated by others. 
For more than three centuries, the Bible in the common tongue was a forbidden book in Spain, and multitudes of copies perished in the flames, together with those who cherished them. Are you guys aware of this part of Roman Catholic history where they're claiming to be Christian, but at the same time they're going around burning up Bibles and killing Christians who chooses to read or study or translate the Bible? This is a very important part of history that must not be forgotten, folks. This gentleman wants to know, how come we can't seem to find manuscripts, Greek manuscripts of 1 John 5-7? Well, it might help if you understood that the Catholic Church was looking for Bibles to burn them up and anybody who believed in the Bible and wouldn't go along with the Catholic belief system, they would find themselves burned up as well. This is a part of history people need to be told about. So you have the king forbidden people under the severest pains from translating the Bible. Or reading it if it's translated by other people. You have Catholic authorities also in England. It mentions here the Archbishop of Canterbury demanded. It says, we therefore decree and ordain that no man so hereafter by his own authority translate any text of the scripture into English or any other tongue. Again, the Catholic Church forbidden the translation of the Bible. They didn't want the Bible in the language of the common man. They had taken the Bible and translated it into Latin. And Latin became a language that over time only the elite spoke. The average person had their own language, but the elite would tend to speak Latin. So they wanted the Bible in the language that the elite religious folks would speak. And it would be over our head. And they didn't want anybody else out there translating the Bible into the language of the common man. They called it the vulgar language. If you didn't know about this, you'd be like this guy saying, where are the manuscripts? What happened to the manuscripts? We're getting there. We're getting there. Pope Leo X, 1513 to 1521. It says here, who railed against Luther's efforts to follow the biblical precept of faith alone and scripture alone, called the Fifth Lateran Council, 1513-1517, which charged that no book should be printed except those approved by the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, forever thereafter, no one should be allowed to print any book or writing without a previous examination to be testified by manual subscription by the papal vicar and master of the sacred palace in Rome. In the other cities and dioceses by the Inquisition and the bishop or an expert appointed by him. For neglect of this, the punishment was excommunication the loss of the edition, which was to be burned. The loss of the edition. What edition? The Bibles that were being translated. If it was not an approved Bible by the Catholic Church, you would lose your edition and it would be burned. So failure to follow their rules would cause your addition to be burned. Your Bible would be burned up. It says here, these restrictions were repeated by the Council of Trent in 1546, which placed translations of the Bible such as the German, Spanish, and English on its list of prohibited books and forbade any person to read the Bible without a license from the Catholic bishop or inquisitor. The following is a quote from the Council of Trent. It says, It shall not be lawful for anyone to print 
or to have printed any books whatsoever dealing with sacred doctrinal matters without the name of the author or in the future to sell them or even to have them in possession unless they have first been examined and approved by the ordinary under penalty of anathema and fine. Are you seeing a pattern, ladies and gentlemen, that the Catholic Church didn't want the people to have the Bible? When they found Bibles, they would burn them? Are you seeing a pattern? This guy's wanting to know, where is the manuscripts? I think you're getting an idea as to what's been happening to the manuscripts, courtesy of the Catholic Church. They hunt them down, they find them, they burn them. That's been their pattern. And that's been their history, to burn our Bibles. That's why it's so hard to find any of the early Bibles, because the Catholic Church has been hunting them down and burning them up. They didn't want us to have the Bible, folks. So they went about trying to find anybody who's translating the Bible to destroy those Bibles. And when you have the money and you have the time, and you have the people who are completely sold out to their particular religion that they're willing to go out and kill, as you're going to see, kill people for having the Bible, and then taking their Bibles that they translated and burning them up, it helps you understand why this book should be held as a treasure to people. To understand that there were so many groups out there trying to burn up the manuscripts of this book so that we couldn't have it. But they weren't able to get them all. And by grace, we got the whole thing. They weren't able to destroy them all. We got it in our language now, and we have the authority and the right to read it, and sadly, most people don't even take the time to read the Bible anymore. And if they do read it, they're reading so-called modern versions, which are translated from Catholic manuscripts which are different manuscripts than what the King James Bible comes from, which is the real manuscripts. These modern versions don't teach the same thing as the King James Bible. They don't say the same as the King James Bible, and they take stuff out of the Bible, and they put stuff into the Bible that don't belong. It's a disgrace. And they keep changing the so-called modern versions every few years. And they don't tell anybody to change anything. Let's keep going here. Pope Clement, 1592 to 605. Forbid a delight license to be granted for reading of the Bible under any condition. Again, trying to ban the reading of the Word of God. This came from uh, Plain Reasons Against Joining the Church of Rome, 1924, page 91. Pope Benedict, 14. 1740 to 1758 says here no version whatsoever should be suffered to be read but those which should be approved by the holy see uh, that means the pope it's got to be approved by the pope accompanied by notes derived from the writings of the holy fathers or other learned catholic authors so if you want to read a bible as far as the catholic church is concerned it's got to be a catholic bible approved by the Catholic Pope with Catholic notes in it. That's probably why they hated the King James Bible, because it's not translated from Catholic manuscript and it doesn't have Catholic notes in it. They hate this book, and you're going to see. They hate this book. To this day, they hate this book. Pope Pius VII this is 1800 to 1823. By now, the King James Bible is already out. By now, the printing press has been invented, and Bibles are being piped out, piped out, piped out so fast, the Catholic Church can't round them all up and burn them. This right here is what we call today a King James Version Bible from 1708. This would have been one made on those printing presses. Look at how big it is. It's huge compared to compared to my Bible today. It's huge. But word for word, T 
teaching for teaching, doctrine for doctrine. This says the same thing as this. They weren't able to burn this one. And it ended up in the hands of a man who's doing the best he can to make sure it stays preserved. Strangely, when I open it up in the cover, the man who owned this book in the 1700s wrote his name in here. Simon Harwood, his book, 1759. And his wife, Deborah Harwood, preserving the word of God to make sure the Catholic Church didn't find it and burn it. We got 1740 to 1758. We got the Catholic Church here saying we're not supposed to have the Bible. Anybody supposed to get the Bible is to be punished. Their Bible's burned. This is from 1708. This one would have been burned. They didn't get it. You know why they didn't get it? My King James Bible says something in the book of Psalms, chapter 12 and verse 6. And the modern versions have felt the need to change this verse. <laughs> but the King James Bible kept it the way it's supposed to be. So let me go ahead and read it off for you. 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God promised he would keep, which means to preserve, his words. Not the thoughts, not the ideas, not the concepts, the words. The same words that Moses penned, that David penned, that Solomon penned, that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, and all the other ancient prophets penned, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John penned, that Paul penned, that Peter penned. God promised he would preserve the words. And he did. With all the power of the Catholic Church trying to find and destroy this book, they didn't get this one. It was preserved. And still being preached from over 300 years later. If you didn't know about this history of the Catholic Church, you'd be completely in the dark. When somebody asks you a question, what happened to the manuscripts? And you had no idea the Catholic Church was burning every Bible manuscript they could find. And at the same time claiming that they're the only true Christian religion. While burning our Christian Bible. And burning Christians to the stake as you're about to see. For having and translating the Bible. Or having a Bible in their possession. Let's keep going. By the time of Pope Pius VII. There had arisen what was called Bible societies, places around the world where they were printing up Bibles in various languages. Catholic Church couldn't stand it. They didn't want us to have the Bible. But there are places, it says here, Germany, Ireland, Canada, uh, Edinburgh, Hungary, Finland, Glasgow, Zurich, Russia, Denmark, Sweden, Netherlands, Iceland, America, Norway, Australia, Paris, and places all over the world were now putting together printing presses and piping out. Actually, I got to hold up this one. Piping out the Word of God. What did the Catholic Church have to say about that? They couldn't round them all up. It says here that Pope Pius said it's a pestilence which he must remedy and abolish. Having Bibles printed was a pestilence? From a religion that claims to be Christian, they view 
you and me having a Bible as having a pestilence. something they needed to remedy. What do they mean by remedy? To take it out of our hand by force if they had to, as you're going to see. September 3rd, 1816, he declared, if the sacred scriptures were allowed in the vulgar tongue everywhere without discrimination, more detriment than benefit would arise. That's really funny because the Jehovah's Witness leadership has the same viewpoint. They've actually written in their literature that if you were to read the Bible alone without their literature, you'd be in the dark. That was written by their leader, Charles Taze Russell. But he claimed that you read his literature and didn't read the Bible at all, per se. You'd be in the light. Well, their leader is dead and gone. His writings aren't even read anymore by the members. They have no clue what he wrote. But guess what? This Bible's still here, and it's still being read. And it's still being believed. And his group that he put together is falling apart because they've been following lies by religious leaders who've been deceiving them for generations. And a lot of their members are waking up and coming out of there. And some of them are becoming real Christians. And sadly, some of them are becoming atheists because that religion has so damaged them that they turned their back on God altogether. That's part of the purpose of my whistleblower's lighthouse uh, ebook is hoping that those that are waking up will actually come to Jesus rather than becoming atheists and becoming you know angry at God because it's not God's fault that they got stuck in a cult. Some of them were born into it. They didn't have any other choice. Pope Gregory, 1831 to 1846. The Pope states, moreover, we confirm and renew the decree cited above, delivered in former times by apostolic authority against the publication, distribution, reading, and possession of books of the Holy Scripture translated into the vulgar tongue. Are you seeing a pattern of popes for generations with the same viewpoint that you and I shouldn't have the Bible? Is that becoming clear? This guy is getting all up in my biscuits. He's all up in my biscuits. Where is 1 John 5, 7? Where is a Greek manuscript of 1 John 5, 7? You don't know your history, son. If you knew your history, you would know what was happening to the manuscripts. You would know the Catholic Church was out there burning up as many manuscripts as they could find. Murdering Christians, burning them to the stake if they dare try to translate the Bible or if they simply had a Bible in their hand. History needs to be taught. Pope Leo XIII, 1897, stated, All versions of the vernacular, even by Catholics, are altogether prohibited unless approved by the Holy See. Nobody's allowed to have a Bible unless it's approved by the Pope. That's how they wanted it. So what were they doing then? How were they going to enforce all this? By force. You see, we Christians, we're not going to let go of our Bible. Nope. Mm -mm. I should say this book taught us about the one who saved us. And we're willing to die for this book, as they found out. It's not going to be so easy to just pry it out of our hands. Unless we're dead and we just can't hang on to it anymore. But this book led us to Jesus. So we're not so easily letting it go. 
as a matter of fact, we ain't letting it go. And when they realized that we Christians were not going to let go of our Bibles, the Catholic Church was not happy. So what did they do to us? What did they do with our Bibles? Why is it that we can't seem to find some of the early Bibles from the early, early days, no matter what the language it was translated into? Why is it so hard to find them? Why are they so scarce? Let's take a look. John Wycliffe, 1324 to 1384. Wycliffe translated Bibles. When the Catholic Church found out about it, they weren't happy. They didn't want the Bible in the hands of the common man. I think you got the message now after all those Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope is saying we can't have the Bible in our language unless it's approved by the Catholic Church. Wycliffe died in 1384. I want you to stop and think about this, what I'm about to tell you. He died in 1384. The Catholic Church was so angry that he had translated the Bible into the language of the average person. 43 years or so later, they dig up his bones and burns his bones. What was his crime exactly? Oh, he was putting God's word into the hands of people. And they consider that a crime. Dug up his body and burned his bones to ashes. It was illegal to own a copy of Wycliffe's Bible, and most of his Bibles that they found, they burned them up. But he wasn't the only one. William Tyndale, again, Bible translator. 1484 to 1536. Translating the Bible. Catholic Church didn't want us to have the Bible. What did they do? Tyndale was imprisoned. October 6, 1536, Tyndale was strangled and burned to the stake. What was his crime exactly? Did he kill somebody? No. Did he steal from somebody? No. He wanted you and I to have the Bible. And the Catholic Church didn't. So they killed him. You don't hear about this side of the Catholic Church when you're watching CNN, do you? Or watching MSNBC or ABC News or NBC News or CBS News or Associated Press or any of these shows, even Fox and some of the others. You don't hear about this side of the Catholic Church. If it was left to them, none of us would have the Bible. Yet people curse King James and mock King James and make fun of King James and lie about King James, claiming he was a homosexual and all this crazy stuff. They tell Christians, you can't read that King James Bible. It's too hard to understand. You need a modern translation. No, you don't. You need the Bible that comes from the manuscripts that were handed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. Not these so-called modern ones that come from manuscripts for their New Testament that was written in the 1800s by Westcott and Hort. Men who were pro-Catholic in their views. Thus, you don't see the Catholic Church going much after the so-called modern versions. It's the King James they hate. 
because it's not tied to the Catholic Church. The Lutheran Bible, 1522. The King of England denounced the work. Elector Frederick and the Duke George of Saxony. In the early months of December, the Duke had ordered his subjects to deposit every copy of Luther's New Testament in the hands of the magistrates. All the states devoted to Rome participated, published similar decrees. In some places, they made sacrilege bonfires of the sacred books. They took Luther's Bibles that he had translated and burned them up. Oh, Jason, Zelda, where are the manuscripts for... Know your history before you come attacking me. Please. According to the book Reformation in Italy, it says here persecutions were poured out by the Catholic authorities upon those who read the works of Luther. An example of those who were tormented for distributing the German Luther New Testament was a bookseller named John of Buddha, Hungary. He had circulated the German scriptures throughout that country. He was bound to the stake. His persecutors then piled his books around him, enclosing him as if in a tower, and then set fire to them. But Jason Zelda, where's the manuscripts? <clears throat> Don't worry, bro. They didn't get them all. We still got the Bible. The Catholic Church lost. They just haven't tapped out yet. But the match is over. It's been over a long time ago. The bells rung a long time ago. They were pinned. One, two, three in the center of the ring. Because God promised he was going to preserve his word, and he did. You're seeing a history of the Catholic Church trying to destroy the Bible, while at the same time claiming to be true Christians. Burning the Bible. But this man, whose only crime is that he's distributing the word of God to the people. They take him. They tie him up to the stake. Hands tied behind his back. And they take all the books, the Bibles, and pile them up. How many Bibles would it take? To pile up like a tower around the guy. And then they set them on fire. With this man. In the midst of it. But to his credit. This man. John. In Buddha Hungary. Books piled over him. He's tied to the stake, hands behind his back. His last words. John manifested unshaken courage, exclaiming from the midst of the flames that he was delighted to suffer in the cause of the Lord. going out with the books going out with the Bible
the Catholic Church didn't break him. Even though he knew he was going to die. All these books piled up around him and all over him. On fire. He's just shouting out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm happy to die for the cause of Christ. I'll see him when I get to heaven. It's going to be great. I can let him know I did a video about him. Hey, bro, I did a video about you down there on earth, man. People didn't even know you existed. I had to remind them. In the book Reformation in Italy, page 28, it says, In 1520, a strict search for Luther's Bibles and books was in, instigated in Venice. And those found were destroyed. The Catholic Church began to persecute other groups like the Anabaptist. It says here, every possible effort was made to suppress this heretic Bible, the German Bible that they had. It was called the Worms Bible after the town that it was printed in, or after the city that it was published in. It says every possible effort was made to suppress this heretic Bible printing office, places where the book was for sale, private houses, and individuals were searched, and all copies found were destroyed. Only three copies survive today. You guys know about all this Bible burning going on by the Catholic Church in the past? Do I have to read more? I can give you a lot more! I'll give you a ton more if you want more. I don't want to beat this thing up, but I want people to understand. There are people out there trying to destroy people's faith in the Word of God. By coming up with things like, well, how come we can't find a Greek manuscript for 1 John 5, 7? Well, we know it's in the Latin, uh, but, but how come we can't find it in Greek? Um, Sir? How did it get from Greek to Latin? Wouldn't they have had a manuscript? And what do they do with the manuscript once they're done with it? Because they didn't want that manuscript to fall into the hands of who they considered as heretics. What would they do with the manuscript when they were done with it, sir? Based upon what you've just been listening to. They would destroy the manuscript, sir. But they didn't get them all. <laughs> they didn't get them all. They tried, though. Boy, did they try. They went door to door. Trying to find Bibles. To burn them up. That's how dedicated they were to try to prevent you and me from having the Bible. That's how dedicated the Catholic Church was to try to make sure you and I didn't have the word of God in our language. Door to door. To confiscate the Bibles and burn them up. Country after country. Door to door. Trying to find manuscripts to burn them up. I got a lot more here. You can see me going through the pages here. Let me just do one more here. 1554. We had a guy smuggling Bibles into France. This is from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Smuggling Bibles. Not drugs. Bibles. But it's 1554. The Catholic Church is running stuff. What was his fate? He was arrested in Normandy and sentenced to be burned alive.
What's your crime, sir? I was trying to get the Bible to people. Guilty! Burn him up! And they felt no remorse about doing it, folks. They felt no remorse about doing it. Yet today, the Catholic Church tried to stand as being the Christian church while hiding this history of how they persecuted and killed Christians. Burned our Bibles. Burned manuscripts. Anything they could find. I think people need to know about this. Let me give you some more. 1546, Peter Chapeau was burnt to death for bringing French Bibles into France. Again, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Also 1546, Stephen Pilate was arrested with a bag of scriptures and gospel books he was distributing. His tongue was cut out and he was burned, his satchel of books hanging about his neck. Just burning him to death wasn't good enough. They had to cut his tongue out too. And then took his satchel that was filled with Bibles and sets him on fire with the satchel still around his neck. Jason Zelda, why do you treasure that King James Bible so much? Why do you keep lifting up that King James Bible and promoting that King James Bible? Brother, what's wrong with you? Don't you know the history? You don't know the history then, do you? How many people had to die to get us this book? How much blood had to be shed to get us this book? And most people don't even read it anymore. Oh, I prefer modern translation. Don't you know those modern translations are easy to read, easy to understand? They got verses missing. Many of them got verses missing. They, they change and mix up doctrine. They've, they've added contradiction to the Bible. I mean, you need to get one of the modern versions, brother. No, thanks. I don't like broken swords. I prefer the real one. It doesn't bend, it doesn't break. And it gets the job done every time it's swung. People don't even know the history. I'm not gonna get on this guy's case too hard. He didn't know. And I also believe that it doesn't seem to matter what I say. He's not gonna change his mind. I didn't do this for him. I did it for you. I hope some of you will have a little bit more respect for God's word. When you understand how many people had to suffer to get it to us. I'm going to have some links down in the comments section. to some of these pages that I'm looking at right now where you can read about men like Diocletian who burned Bibles burned manuscripts hunted people down like dogs persecuted Christians like you wouldn't believe I'll let you read it for yourself. I hope I've answered the guy's question properly. Where are the Greek manuscripts for 1 John 5, 7? There's a few left, but there's not going to really be many available before the 1600s because the Catholic Church found a bunch of them and burned them up. But not to worry, my brother. They didn't get them all. Because the King James translators happen to have one. Must have. Because 1 John 5, 7 is in here. 
God preserved his words as he promised he would. All right. Well, let's get on to the next question then. Masanma, 1971, writes, Jason, do you have thoughts on the Book of Enoch? Reese, 9669, writes, maybe the missing books or deleted books have a lot to do with it. Jason Zelda, yes, books of the Bible were removed like Enoch and many others. Reese, 9669, writes. Hmm. Books removed from the Bible? And should the book of Enoch be in the Bible? Well, let's start with the book of Enoch. This is the word of God. King James Bible. Okay, we got it. 66 books. We live on a planet, we're told now, of over 8 billion people. How many read this book as it is? Let's just be honest. How many reads the King James? Oh, wait a minute, Jay. You know, there are people around the world, they speak other languages. Yeah, people in other countries speak other languages. And many times they speak their native language and English. When you go to a lot of foreign countries, you'll see a lot of their signs are in the native tongue and English. God knew the English language would become a universal language. Thus, he put his word into English in a time before a lot of the movements that are corrupting things ever came into be. Before the sodomy movement, the feminist movement, the politically correct movement, and all of these agendas and social justice and all this stuff that's sweeping the world now, this Bible was already translated. Therefore, it's not influenced by it like the modern versions are. That's why they're making the modern versions gender neutral because they don't want to offend anybody. God couldn't care less if you're offended by his word. He said it, he meant it. As for the book of Enoch, though, I have to ask, which version of the book of Enoch? There's a whole bunch of versions of books of Enoch. Which one should go in the Bible? A simple search will show you there's a whole bunch of different books calling themselves the book of Enoch. But one thing you will learn in your search is none of them were actually written by Enoch. None of them. Zero. Enoch lived in the days of Noah. That's a long time ago. He ain't writing books. There are people who are writing books and putting Enoch's name on it. But it's not the book of Enoch. Even recently, somebody came out with, we'll put it on the screen for you, the book of Enoch, MSV, the modern standard version of the book of Enoch. Let's look at what this thing says. The modern standard version is an easy to read and accessible introduction to the book of Enoch. This Bible based version is an excellent way to study and learn these ancient concepts. Bible based version? Mm, no. This ain't based on the Bible. Book of Enoch's not based on the Bible. It's a fanciful story of somebody taking Genesis chapter 6 and blowing it out to the maximum. Putting stuff in the Bible never said. So how can it be Bible based? Again, Enoch didn't write this. So how is it Bible-based? Enoch didn't write it.
I don't know. That's no, no, it doesn't go. This is what the page says here. It's got this here on the page for this brand new MSV version of the Book of Enoch. Here's what it says here. It says, get all of the Enoch MSV footnotes for free. We want to share with you one of the primary reasons why the Book of Enoch MSV is so different than all the other versions currently available. Wait a minute. So how many other versions of the Book of Enoch are out there? And they're saying, hey, our version is even more different than those versions. Okay. Things that are different are not the same. So your version is not the real Book of Enoch. Because you're admitting you're making changes. But the original Book of Enoch wasn't even written by Enoch. It's fanciful reading. It's an interesting story, an interesting tale. It wasn't written by Enoch. Thus, it's not in the Bible. It's not scripture. Again, it's good reading. It's not scripture. So it's not in the Bible. It shouldn't be in the Bible. Just like the apocryphal books. It's not scripture. It's fanciful reading. It's not scripture. Only the scripture belongs in the Bible. Not regular average history books or fanciful written books where we don't know who the author is. The scripture belongs in the Bible, just the scripture. That's why in 1611, when the King James Bible came out, it originally had the Apocrypha in it. Yeah, it had the Apocrypha in it. But unlike the Catholic Church that mixed the Apocrypha in with the books of the Bible, the King James Bible didn't do that. You had the Old Testament in its own section. Then in between the Old and the New, you had this little section in the middle that had apocryphal books. Then you had the New Testament. But then, then wait a minute. The Apocrypha is very questionable. It's not scripture. It may be history. It may be fanciful reading. But it's not scripture. They went through all that trouble to translate it, and then they realized, wait a minute, the Old Testament is scripture. The New Testament is scripture. This stuff here, it's fanciful reading. It might be some history in there, but it's not scripture. The Bible should only be for the scriptures. Now, if you go online today, you'll find people saying, well, you know, the Apocrypha was removed from the Bible in the 1800s. Hmm, that's news to me. When did my Bible get published? Let's put it on the screen. It says here 1708. Let me bring it up there to you. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. Holy Bible. Notice it doesn't say King James Version. It wasn't called a King James Version back then. It was simply called the Holy Bible. And notice it says here, printed in the year 1708. Right there. The Holy Bible. King James never after his name be put on the Bible. Printed in the year 1708. On the internet, they claim that the Apocrypha was removed in the 1800s. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you, the table of contents, because right now a lot of these pages are loose. And uh, there we go, table of contents right here. So right here I have the table of contents from this Bible. Again, I'm keeping it on the screen so you can see I didn't swap it with anything. This is the table of contents from this Bible. Do you see listed the Apocrypha. Do you see it anywhere? This is from 1708, which is less than a hundred years after the first, what we call today, King James Bible. Back then they didn't call it the King James Bible. They simply called it the Holy Bible. Do you see anywhere the Apocrypha in the table of contents? It ain't there. So the Apocrypha was not removed in the 1800s. It was removed long before the 1800s. 
because it didn't belong in the Bible. It didn't belong in the Bible. It's fanciful reading, yes. Might be some history there, yes. Is it scripture? No. So, what are my thoughts on the book of Enoch? Fanciful reading. It's not genuine. Enoch didn't write it. And it's not scripture. Doesn't belong in the Bible. That's my answer. Lastly, the letter J. You'll be surprised how many atheists out there attacks the Bible based upon the letter J. How many people have had their minds and hearts turned against the Bible because of the letter J? And you might say, well, what's about the letter J? What's, what's the issue with that? Their argument is, they say, well, you know, Jason Zelda, if you were smart, you would know that the ancient Hebrew and the Koine Greek, they don't have J's. The J wasn't even invented till just, you know, a few hundred years ago. So, you know, Jason... Brother, you wrong. How can his name be Jesus when there was no J? The J wasn't even invented until a few hundred years ago, they tell me. And I sit back and go, hmm. Do I need a J for his name to be Jesus? Think about it. Do you need a J? For his name to be Jesus. Stop and think. Don't answer it wrong. Do you need a J. For his name to be pronounced Jesus. What if I spelled his name. G-E-S-U-S. -S? Wouldn't it still be. Jesus. It's no J. But it's still going to be pronounced Jesus isn't it. Richard Chaudis, 1931, says, How can the divine name mean Jehovah when there was no J, no V, and no vowels? Dick Tracy, 6905, or 6904, writes, I have downloaded the 1611 King James Bible, and J isn't in it. The letter U is used for V, and vice versa. Is this authentic? He actually wrote, is this authentic, but... I know what he meant. Nana Yaw Young, 7078, writes, But the letter J is only 500 years old. The letter didn't even exist until somewhere in the 1700s. So what was his original name back then? Bernadette, 4484, writes, Dear Mr. Zel uh, Dear Mr. Jason, March 2018, I came across a site that convinced me the name Jah is God's name. I believe them because they preached the letter J didn't exist, etc. However, after time, I began to question other teachings, so I quit their site. Just a day ago, I came across your site, and I definitely want to learn more. I'm confused. There are so many questions I have. Thank you for sending me this video. You explain very well. Bernadette, I salute you. You were one who had been sucked into the J-trap. But you made your way out. Here's the argument, and I'm going to show you the flaw in the argument. This is from Google. Let's put this on the screen. Because you say, you know, the letter J in the Bible, or did the letter J exist in the manuscripts? And you'll get stuff like this popping up in Google. The letter J in the name Jesus, part two. The missing J, Jesus, which later employed the letter J as a derivation. The letter J is the proper name of Jesus with the letter Y or the letter J. 
the list just goes on and on. Guys, research, research, research. It ain't that hard. This one was so easy. I'm going, really, guys? You couldn't do this. We live in a world today where far too many people will not research for themselves. They'll listen to somebody else and believe what that person said without doing any research on their own. This one was easy. You don't need a J for it to be Jesus. You don't need a J for it to be Jerusalem. You need a, don't need a J for it to be Joshua. You don't need a J for it to be Judges. You don't need a J. You simply need a letter that gives the J sound. Does Hebrew have a letter that gives the J sound? Yes. It's called the Yod. It gives the Y sound. It gives the J sound. Just like in English, we have the letter C. The letter C gives off two distinctively different sounds. The word ice cream, both have the letter C, but one C gives an S sound and the other C gives a K sound, but it's still the letter C. And in ancient Hebrew, they have the Yod, which gives the Y sound and gives the J sound. But the people who are pushing this J nonsense, they haven't done the research. Or even worse, they know about the Yod and willfully chooses to lie to turn you against this book. That would be even worse if they have done the research and are intentionally lying about this. Because they've turned a lot of people against this book using this false J argument. But let's get on to the, the bottom line here. What about the Greek? Oh, Jason Zelda, there's no J in Greek. I mean, when we look at these old books, it has an I, not a J. You're wrong, Jason Zelda. It's supposed to be an I, not a J. There's a lot of people put a lot of stock in Strong's. I'm not a big fan of Strong's when it comes to definitions of words. But when I did pull up the Strong's, because it does have the Koine Greek, and I pull up other Koine Greek, I want you to see something. I have here a verse from the Bible that has the name of Jesus twice. I want you to see something that the people who push this J argument doesn't bother to tell you. Here's the verse with the Greek, the Koine Greek, and the English underneath. I want you to take a close look at the Greek word for Jesus. Look very closely at that word. Does it begin with an I? Look really close. Does it begin with an I? Or does it begin with a accent mark and then the I? Let's go to the next mention of Jesus' name over here. Does it begin with an I? Or does it begin with an accent mark, a little hook, and then the I? Notice in the word above, they have an I and they left out the hook. And that's where the confusion is coming from. Part of the problem that we're having is that people are claiming, oh, we're making uh, copies of the 1611 King James Bible. And what they're doing is they're putting in the I without the accent mark. Here it is a little bit bigger so you can see it better. It has the word Jews. Again, it begins with a J. But what's the first letter, folks? Accent mark, and then the I. The accent mark is a, it's a hook. It's a hook, and then the I. Could it be, for those of you who deal with this J argument, could it be 
that that little hook changes the sound of the I to the sound of a J. And that's why it's there. Because stop and think. What exactly is a J? It's an I with a hook on it. And in the Koine Greek, the words beginning in J is an I with a hook. Maybe that's where our English J came from. The English language was a relatively young language back then. So as we're building our alphabet, we would have to adapt in order to fit these sounds. We in English ultimately had to adapt our language, the spelling of our words, to that. Let me give you an example. This is one of the benefits of having this super old Holy Bible. I'm going to open it up here to the book of Revelation. This more than 300 year old book <laughs> is about to preach to you. I want you to see something and I need to be very, very careful lifting this. Give me just a second here. Okay. In 1708, the English language was still relatively young and they spelt words mm, a little differently because some words, the le letters hadn't matured yet. I'm going to bring this close to the screen. Hopefully I can get it where you can see it. And I want you to notice that it says the revelation of J E F. U.S. Isn't that what it says? The revelation of Jeffus Christ. Cryf. C-H-R-I-F-T. Do you see that? Why does it read and have the spelling of the name of Jesus as J E? F U S and not J E S U S in 1708. You got to think. Is his name really Jeffus? No. If you look at the word Christ, it should let you know because it's spelled in here C H R I F T. And please take note that the word show, servant, shortly, and sent also begins with the letter F. In 1708, the letter F and the letter S gave the same sound. Therefore, they were interchangeable. But as time moved forward and the English language matured, the F got its own sound and the S came in to have the S sound. So in later editions of the Holy Bible, the spelling was updated so that we could pronounce his name correctly. The F was given its own sound, the F sound. But we needed a letter in English that gave the S sound. So we got the letter S. And the later editions of the Holy Bible, all the places where they put an F, where it should be an S, because the F gave the S sound back then, they knew if they kept the F in there, a whole bunch of words in the Bible would be mispronounced. Because the English language was now maturing. This letter gives this sound. This letter gives this sound. This letter gives this sound. Instead of this letter gives this sound and this sound, this letter gives this sound and this sound, this now, no, they didn't want that confusion. They did leave us with the letter C that still gives two different sounds. But when it came to letter S, they wanted to make sure that we could pronounce these words properly. 
and later editions, they just updated the spellings so that we could pronounce the words right. We didn't need the letter J in the ancient manuscripts. We just needed letters that gave the J sound. That's all. And we already have them. Doesn't matter if we invented the J 500 years ago. Other languages had letters that gave the sound of J long before English existed. You just have to do your research. We're late getting on board with our language. But at the same time, the English language swept the world and the other languages didn't. And God knew that the English language would sweep the world, so he made sure that his word was put into that language. And to this day, English-speaking missionaries go all over the world preaching the word of God. And if they know their stuff, they'll still be using this King James Bible. And not the so-called New King James, which is a fake counterfeit translation. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Three more questions answered. Please send more. Because I like these mental challenges. Love these mental challenges. Because if I don't know something, it gives me a reason to go and research and find out more. I'm hoping that this really helps to build your faith and understanding. I want more people to come to the Word of God. Guy says here, what about the lost books of the Bible? What lost books of the Bible? Ain't no books lost, bro. People ain't even reading what's already in there. You think people are going to start reading? You add five more, 10 more, 20 more. How much bigger is this book going to be? You start adding all these books to it. And people ain't even reading it anyway. But the few who do take the time to read it and read it again and read it again, because there's no way you can take in all this information in one swoop. There's no way. It's way too much in, in here. Way too much in here. You can't just read it from cover to cover and go, okay, I'm done. I read the whole Bible. I know all that's in it. And ain't no way. You got to read through it and read through it again and read through it again and read through it again. Because each time you read through it, you're going to find things you missed the first time. But when it comes to the basic doctrines, you'll catch that on the first time through. As you go through, you'll learn more and you'll learn more and you'll learn more and you'll learn more and you'll learn more. And you'll be able to answer some of those hard questions people ask you. Why did this happen in the Bible? Why is this story in the Bible? Why is this going on in the Bible? You'll be able to say, okay, this story is in the Bible because this story connects to this story over here. And this story connects to this story over here. And if you just read this by itself, you're not going to know what in the world's going on. But if you took the time to read this and this and you put it together with this and this, you go, ah, I get it. You can't do it in one felt swoop, though. It takes time. It takes time. So for those of you who ask me questions, I hope I've successfully answered your questions. I hope I've done it well. I'm looking forward to more questions coming. And guys, do me a favor. Go ahead and get my book, The Whistleblower's Lighthouse. If you're one of those who are trying to reach your whole witness, if you have friends or family who are trapped in that cult, get a hold of that ebook. Use it. Try to get them out of the cult. There's so much stuff I put in there. So many topics that I cover. So many topics on the Watchtower stocks, how to beat the Watchtower in court, how to win child custody cases against your whole witnesses, dealing with their John 1 1 issue without using the Bible. Remember, I've never been a Jehovah's Witness. Never will become one. But I've researched their group long enough to know how to deal with some of these things. And I found a way of reaching them with John 1.1 1, 1 without ever even using the Bible. And they're not trained to deal with that. They're used to argue with you from the Bible because they have their own altered version, their own custom-made Bible. So they put their custom-made Bible against the real Bible, and it just becomes tit for tat, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But if you use the technique I have in my book, you might be able to reach them because they've not been trained to deal with John 1.1 1, 1 the way that I deal with it in my ebook. I cover a whole bunch of topics in there. Got some rare stuff in there, rare pictures, rare images uh, that you're going to be pretty scarce to find. And I want to thank a lot of people out there who did a lot of work before me. And I'm not trying to step on nobody's toes. But if you're trying to reach your holiness, 
get them to come out of the cult, get a hold of the Whistleblowers Lighthouse. Website www.jasonzelda, like the video game, The Legend of Zelda, jasonzelda.xyz. jasonzelda.xyz. And you can pay any amount you want to pay over two dollars you want to pay three bucks you can get it for three bucks if you want to pay more than three you want to pay five ten twenty thirty fifty hundred two hundred pay whatever you want whatever you think it's worth over 500 pages and i put it in pdf form that way you don't need any special programs or anything to use it you should be able to use it with your phone you should be able to use it with your laptop you should be able to use it with tablet you should be able to use it with desktop you should be able to use it with everything somebody gave me some information yesterday and about how to put my uh, ebook on to Amazon. So I'm going to try to see if I can get it over to Amazon when I get some free time. Also, I was interviewed yesterday by Rick Farron and the Six Screens program, and I'll have a link for that down in the description too if you guys want to hear a little bit about the, the interview that he probably interviewed me for over an hour, asking me questions about my book, my ebook, and, and things of that nature. And people called in and, and talked with me, and it was very nice to be able to talk with the people who were calling in. And, and things like that. So if you guys are interested in that, that will be also in the description. Okay, and before we close out, I need to end off with this. There are some who've asked me on a number of occasions, I want to contribute to the ministry you're in. I want to help support you. You've been very helpful to me, blah, 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 this, that, the other. And I appreciate the kindness people have shown. So if you are wanting to donate something, these are the ways and the only ways to reach me. Here you have QR codes on your screen. The top one is for my ebook. So if you have a QR code reader, you know how to go through, just snap on that and it'll take you right to my ebook and you can pay whatever amount that you want to pay. Just be careful not to put in too much or they're going to flag it uh, as suspicious. If you're wanting to send larger amounts, use the middle QR code, which takes you right to my PayPal page and you can send an amount there. And thirdly is my music site. Again, the QR code is at the bottom, and my music site is jasonzelda.com. So my ebook, jasonzelda.xyz, or you can use the QR code that's on the screen. If you want to send a donation just directly and you're not really interested in getting anything, just use the middle QR code, or you can go onto PayPal and use musicalgarden at comcast.net, musicalgarden at comcast.net, and that'll take you right to my paypal or you can get my music which is jasonzelda.com and the bottom qr code before we go i need to address this as well if anybody comes to you in the chat room using a profile that's using my profile picture and they're pretending to be me and they're asking you to go to sites like telegram or whatsapp or claiming that you won some kind of prize or something i want you to know that that is not me there are scammers now on youtube who've been ripping people off by leaps and bounds by pretending to be the youtuber stealing their profile picture creating fake profiles and then going into the chat room and pretending to be that youtuber and ripping people off out of a lot of money i do not want you guys to become victims so i'm not going to be going to anybody in the chat room wanting to send you to some site other than the ones that i have here my book site my music site or directly to my paypal that's it so if anybody comes on using my profile picture and trying to get you to sites like Telegram or WhatsApp or something like that, that is not me. Those are scammers. Report them immediately because I do not want you guys to get ripped off. Every bit helps because of all the hospital stays and surgeries that I've had in the last two years, the medical bills have packed up on me and it's not been pretty. And I still got at least one more surgery coming to deal with the prostate cancer issue. So... When that's over, I plan on doing a video on health because I've been through so many things in my life health wise. And I want to give you guys some of the solutions that I found. Whether it be Bell's palsy that I went through, high blood pressure, ruptured disc in my neck, double massive ear infection that wrecked me a little over a year ago. It went undiagnosed way too long and it really messed me up. And now with this prostate cancer issue, it's been one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. And yes, the bills have stacked up. 
and I'm in over my head, but it's okay. I'm, I'm still preaching the word of God. He'll take care of me. And until next we meet, ladies and gentlemen, you know what it's all about. I'll see you guys down the road. Not everybody. Don't you know the drones? Remember the party can't start to miss the dawn.